Yo, what is up, y'all? And welcome back to the Grind Time Shop, where today we got Season 5, Episode 4. Oh, is it 4? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> you weren't aware? No. <laughs> okay, Episode 4, yeah. Season 5. Together we print podcasts. Cool. I'm going to give you one more try. Season 5, Episode, episode four. 4. That's right, y'all. Uh, and we got a jam-packed episode, as predicted, quote, we caught up. Okay. Real and quick. Now it's pretty much slammed week. And I'm going to say that next week's it's also like, going to be slammed week. Yeah, it's more like a slam couple weeks. Yeah, it's going to be an For interesting sure. situation. Uh, but at the same time, so much stuff going on. Uh, and we're going to get into all of it today. Plus, we got special guest Mr. Brian Bernard here on the podcast to talk about his career in live painting and art. So kick back and relax. The Together We Print podcast starts right now. All right, y'all, and we are back, uh, and it's been insanity this week. Yeah, it's yeah, it, for next sure. week's not gonna be any, any better. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Uh, blessed to be busy, and uh, never a bad thing to have so much going on. But uh, just as we predicted in the last episode, all of these quotes were gonna catch up at one time, and, and they did. Yeah, everybody paid within about three days, about eight quotes all at the same time. And uh, we, you know, we take a lot of pride here at the Grind Time Shop in being able to turn around garments in uh, a competitive turnaround time. A timely manner. A timely manner. But, you know, we know. Yeah. Uh, if you work in the screen print industry, and for those of y'all who really work in any art industry, uh, competitive turnaround time is probably one of the most important things yeah. to keeping your business successful because... If people want things fast this day and age in the internet age where you can go on and Amazon can have. I mean, dude, I ordered a phone case from Amazon not long ago. Showed up the same daggum day. What? The same day. Oh, wow. I ordered it at 9 a.m. It was here by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. What? Okay. Now, it was fulfilled by the local Amazon facility. Yeah, it makes so it a little easier. So, they had the cases right there. They right, were just able right. to bring it over. But at the same time, in a day and age where, you know, you can have something 12 hours after you order it sometimes – it's pretty convenient. A competitive turnaround time is important, right? Mm -hmm. Like people want their T-shirts and they want, or their garments, their hats, whatever it may be, and they want them fast. So we try to keep a very competitive turnaround time here in the shop, and uh, it's difficult right now. Yeah, with <laughs> as many jobs as we have, I mean, we're kind of having to just like, you know, it, it's it's we'll get them to you as quick as we possibly can. I, I mean, at the same time, some stuff is kind of out of our hands. You know, when you're waiting on garments to show up, or you're yeah, for or sure, thing, or or for you sure. know, prepping and, artwork, things like that. It's just it's and especially with us not here full time. Well, and that's that what I was gonna all, say. All makes it a little bit more difficult. That's what I was gonna really get into next was just the fact that like we are a two man operation with a part time schedule. Um, so it makes scheduling and time management even more important yeah. than it would be in like a full-time shop because we realistically are only here very small portion of the time throughout the week. Yep. And we really have to do a good job of sitting down and going, all right, Monday, we got to knock out this, this, and this Wednesday, we got garments showing up for that. And yep. we got to knock yep. out this, this, and this. And it's constantly kind of a reassessing what's here what we, can we, be done we next. juggle everything day day by day yeah it just kind of depends on what's available and especially right now when shipping and uh you know the delays in like freight yep uh or even just like the the hard time it can you can face trying to find garments yes. i mean you know in general like uh you know that's been very difficult for us lately i had an order in just last week that uh literally uh, i was able to get every single thing they needed except like some 2XLs in a certain color. Right. And it's only like two of them. So, like, yeah, I could go over to a, another website and try and find them in stock. But the now issue we got to pay, pay, pay more shipping and we got all this other 100%, stuff. 100%. But the issue is those 2XLs are sold out in that shirt on like every website I find. Yep. So now we're faced with, okay, what's the comparable garment that we can put you in in a 2XL that's going to work with the rest of them? So there's a lot of juggling that happens right now in the industry because of the way things are set up, even just. This supplies on ink like yeah. we're limited to buying a gallon of ink from our main screen print supplier on white ink right now at a time because they don't have enough to go around to all the customers 
so it's becoming just kind of a process. And uh, like I said, time management is one of the, the biggest things for us in the shop that kind of keeps us on track and, and allows us to have that competitive turnaround time. But uh, with everything we got going on right now, we will get it done. We will get it done. We will and, and we're already moving through it. Uh, I think we've got a good schedule ahead to get everything out. We got jobs coming up for Cumberland Band, Valley Arts Tattoo Studio, Eagle Air Jacks, Allegiance Roof Systems. We got more Sepsa Shooting Academy. Mm -hmm. And then we got this big order of uh, splits, splits and, underbelly. and underbelly stuff yeah. that, that finally is here. All the garments are here. Um, artwork's been printed and screens are getting ready to be burned this week. So it's uh, it's absolutely slammed. But on top of all of that, we got some brand new together. We print shirts on the way. Yep. All right. So, yeah, obviously, we've been doing the podcast for about four or five seasons. You'd think, uh, being a screen print shop, we'd probably have already made. Yeah, you'd together think so. we print podcasts. Five seasons in, and <laughs> we don't have no. However, we have not, but we are about to. And uh, as we talked in one of the most recent episodes about, we've been working heavily with Cody on yep. some new together we print assets uh, because he kind of just is our dude and he understands this and he was here from the beginning and and uh the stuff he's come up with is absolutely incredible we are so excited to share it with y'all and with that i want to go ahead and announce that we're going to be giving away 20 shirts to 20 winners alan had no idea look at his puzzled face we're going to be giving away 20 of these Together We Print podcast shirts to 20 lucky winners. All you have to do is make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Links will be in the description of this podcast video right here. Send us an email to grindtimeclothingconcepts at gmail.com with your name and size t-shirt in the subject line. Make sure to include a name and valid shipping address in your email. The first 20 people to email us will get some Together We Print shirts mailed out in their size for free. All right, so y'all go ahead, do, follow all those steps, shoot us over an email. If you're confused on the steps, description of the video, description of the podcast, go ahead and shoot us over an email. First 20 people are going to get some Together We Print podcast shirts. That's happening. Apparently. Yes. <laughs> you just announced it. Came out your sales commission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. It really didn't, guys. No, I don't think that. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to be giving away some shirts. And uh, with that, I think we're kind of all caught up on the shop. I don't know, anything um, else you see major going on in the shop this week? It, everything is major. <laughs> He's so flabbergasted by the shirt thing. <laughs> yeah, I was just taken back by it. I got some shirts. We're going to give some away. Yeah, get excited. I, I see that. Yeah, get I hear excited. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, with that, I think we're all caught up on the shop. And now a word from our sponsors. Today's podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, Allegiance Roof Systems. For all your roofing needs, commercial or residential. They're one of the top roofing companies in Northeast Florida, and they also give free estimates. Call them at 904-449-2416 and get yourself a new roof that will last a long time. Once again, that's 904-449-2416, and let them know that the Grind Time Boys sent you Allegiance Roof Systems. All right, y'all, and we are back. That's going to go ahead and bring us on into our Artist Spotlight section of the podcast. And for those of y'all who are not too aware what the Artist Spotlight is, it's just a time where we take a second to shout out people who are doing cool stuff. We all get caught in the monotony of scrolling through our phones every single day. We smash that double tack that like button, that love heart. Mm -hmm. But who really sees it? Let's be real. The algorithms are not showing that crap to half the people. So this is just a time where we take a second to say, hey, we saw you. We think you're doing some cool stuff, and let's tell some people about it. So, Alan, why don't you go ahead and take it away with our artist spotlight for today? Well, uh, it is on Instagram under Ramon Sketch. All one word, Ramon Sketch. Uh, he's an illustrator cartoonist, and he makes some of the sickest art I have ever seen Ooh. recently. Yeah, that's um, sweet. That's what caught my eye was this the, squeegee the hand with the squeegee, and I was like, oh, well, that's cool. What else does he have? Dude loves pizza art. He does so much art with pizza uh -huh. and things like that, <laughs> dude. It's just like it, it's it's got a vibe to itself, dude. Look at this hand, you know, down, oh, uh, coming out of the toilet. Pooping. <laughs> <laughs> on a toilet, like, it's just crazy cool stuff, man. Like, I, I really like it. It's really awesome. Uh, dude is phenomenal. And then 
in the in the process of scrolling through all his stuff up at the top, if you go up, you can see he it says House of Printing. Ah. You click on that, and he owns a screen printing company. Oh, well, uh, there you so go. You can check that out as well. Oh, look um, at this squeegee boy. Yes, dude. Yeah, There's some really yeah. good stuff. Oh, like he's shoot, doing some man. of the art that he has. Look at that. Yeah, that's sick. On a bandana, bro. Is, Is that, that a bandana? A bandana? No. Oh, boxes. Boxes. Still. Wow. Putting yeah, that, that's that, pretty awesome. That, that, it, it's that now yeah. that's on a shirt, you know. So some of this stuff that his art, him these being, are bandanas. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um. He's doing sick stuff, dude. Yeah, dude. and he owns a and he owns a screen print shop, which yeah, is awesome. So he's not only crushing it in the art field, but he's also crushing it in the printing. Yeah, yeah, man. I yeah. mean, it's 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 so sick. Um, so his screen printing shop on Instagram. I don't know how to pronounce that. Is it is it uh, Sueva underscore uh, Negra <laughs> or something? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, so yeah. it's a uh, C U E V A underscore N E G R A. Uh, that's his screen printing shop. And then if you uh, want to see his uh, personal, uh, like, uh, you know, artistry stuff, um, you know, he's a Ramon Sketch. Scr- yeah, Ramon Sketch, all one word on Instagram. Um, and uh, looks like he's doing quite a bit of stuff for people. I mean, dude's got like 34,000 followers on here, so he's, yeah, he's, he's uh, crushing it. He's got a big cartel store where right, you can go yeah, check out go some there. of his stuff. So definitely check out Ramon Sketch on uh, Instagram and everywhere else. And uh Give him a like, give him a follow, show him some love. Uh, I know we're going to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we might use this guy definitely for some, uh, for Get some new designs or something. design stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be tight. So yeah, check that guy out. Well, that's what's up, and that's going to go ahead and wrap up our Artist Spotlight, which is going to bring us right on into our guest interview, y'all. Our guest today is a professional painter living in the Jacksonville, Florida area. He can be found almost any night of the week live painting all over town at concerts or even at many of the Spirit of Swanee Music Park festivals. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Brian Bernard, y'all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey. <laughs> What's up, Brian? What's going on, guys? Not a whole lot, man. Thanks for coming out. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so obviously, right off the rip, I'm going to just hop right into it. We've known each other for a while. I, yeah. I think I met you around. Tw- I was trying to pinpoint it when I was I writing like down the first info. First Blackwater. That's what I was. I have Blackwater right yeah. here. So that was about the time I remember meeting you, and uh, I remember just being like, "Wow, this dude's sick!" Like, and then I found out. That you were from the Jacksonville area, which is such a crazy thing. I feel like there's so many times that I was out at the Swanee Park and I would meet somebody and I'd be like, oh, you're really cool. I've never met you before. I hang out with them for the entire weekend and then find out on the last day that they live like 20 minutes down the road in Jacksonville. It's just that (laughs) big of a it's that big, small city kind of thing, you know. Um, But yeah, like I said, I remember meeting you and just being like, man, this dude's art is absolutely incredible and me that's you know visual art has never been my biggest thing it's never been what i'm incredibly good at yeah. uh it's all audio art was kind of like always my thing like making music whereas visual drawing and everything it just it wasn't there man i've really had to kind of train myself to see it and and feel designs and and you know uh design with shapes and subtraction of shapes and stuff like that but I'm always interested, and I always start with the guests talking about the origin story, right? So I want to know, how did you get into painting, man? Was it something that you – did you start drawing as a kid? Was your family into art? Like, kind of tell me how you got into that. Well, I've always been into drawing since I was a little kid. Like, I remember being a four-year-old, and I've got one older brother, and he used to draw, and I'd watch him draw, and then I think that kind of encouraged me to draw a little bit. Yeah. But uh, I was always kind of – just had a natural inclination towards uh drawing and sketching and stuff and you know i remember being like oh i i made the best finger painting painting in kindergarten or something yeah like yeah, that. yeah but uh I, along the years i i always kept up with my artwork and uh drawing but i didn't really get into painting until i started going to college okay and uh i live in fernandina beach right north of jacksonville yep. in the area here and the first two years, I went to back then FCCJ shout out. Yep, you know, yep, FCCJ <laughs> now, but yeah, FCCJ yep. forever for me. But uh, <laughs> so you know, I started taking art classes there and getting into painting. And really, in the beginning, I was trying to go more for graphic design. But back in the you know 2000 era, yep, 
computers and uh, you know yeah, it's come a long way and yeah ipads and all that stuff wasn't around as much yep and it was a little harder to get into it and i just kind of didn't really get into it and then i had some painting classes and really this was more i went to fccj and then i moved over to fsu for four years okay and i got an art degree and uh awesome. went into the bfa program there but when i got into college over there i took some uh painting classes and uh, I really liked that and just kind of took off in that direction. <laughs> and um, so I really have been painting since about 2000. Gotcha. And right now I'm about to turn 42 in <laughs> April. So, you know, for the last 22 years I've been painting in the last, uh, you know, whatever, 38 years I've been making artwork. That's awesome, man. That's, so, uh, that's absolutely something crazy. That I feel like in olden times art, and artisans in com small communities were a much bigger part of communities. Oh, 100%. And, like, whether it was painting, pottery, or basket weaving or something, like, pe certain people are just made to be creative yep. types. And uh, I just always felt that about myself, that uh, whatever time I was born into, you know, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd be, like, some sort of creative person. Yeah, for sure. But, um, but yeah, you know, I was painting – all throughout college and everything. And then I moved back to the area in around 2006. Okay. And, um, you know, I worked in restaurants and pizza restaurants for like yep. 10 years, like a lot of us. And um, all that time I was making artwork. And in Fernandina Beach, I worked at Moon River Pizza for a long yep. time. Moon and they've had some my of the artwork. best pizza. Such good pizza. They've had my the artwork pizza. in there oh, yeah. from like 2006 to now. That's like awesome, I've had dude. artwork in there for – Whatever that is. I've been six, seeing your art yeah. there for as long as I can remember. So, yeah. um, you know, I was selling artwork all along. And uh, then uh, I had a show where I met Jared Trantham, one of our uh -huh. mutual buddies. Yep. Shout yep. out to Jared, Lost Sailor. Lost Sailor Leather, and, yeah. Um, and Jared makes leather, and he was selling leather at different festivals for a long time. And he knew about the whole scene of live painters yeah at music events and he yeah. was like yo you gotta come out and paint at some shows i got all kinds of buddies that are in bands in jacksonville and uh i really fought it i didn't want you know I'm like yeah. i i make my artwork at home i don't want people watching me yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um but he talked me into it and uh the first show i painted at was at uh like out professor you know and at a real venue was yeah. uh a greenhouse lounge show okay at yeah. jackrabbits yeah. i think it was giant panda gorilla dub squad okay and greenhouse lounge at jackrabbits so great shout show out jackrabbits <laughs> shout, shout out jason Jack honeycutt <laughs> yeah greenhouse lounge. tim hall <laughs> yeah. all of them you know so all of them. Uh, absolutely um the so I, so I painted that show and you know i think i sold a painting that night to um jalonius mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, that he still has yeah, Jeremy. And, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, just kept building up from there. Uh, that show went well. And then uh, I just kept meeting people. And, yeah, and, you absolutely. Know, meeting different musicians. Did you enjoy it that night? Like when you were there doing it, like how you were worried about people watching you? Like, was it, did it play like a intimidation factor or a nervousing factor? Yeah, definitely. At all? Like, I mean, I still get nervous now, but, uh, but then it was like, oh, God, can I finish a painting? Yeah, in, in that amount in of time. Window? Yeah, right. for sure. Um, and then, you know. That I, would that would be something that I would majorly, I would think would be a struggle. Like the, uh, for me, uh, when creating a design, I, sometimes I'll take like weeks on it. You yes. know, like I'll literally go back and forth and back and forth trying to <laughs> get a design finished up. And uh, it's one of those things where, I'll, I'll work on it, tinker on it for a few days, and then I'll walk away for a few days and I'll come back. And when I think about the idea of having to like sit down in a blocked out amount of time and go from start of conception to finished product, it it's definitely seems intimidating. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It seems like something you would have to, to work at getting towards, you know? Yeah. yeah, definitely working on painting faster, you know, not really worrying about people watching you or talking to you. Yeah, 100%. You're, while you're painting and all that. But... I feel like I got over it pretty quickly. Yeah. And uh, I always tell people painting on a show in front of people is like drawing, sketching in your notes in like high school where you just yeah, you're yeah, like yeah. listening to your teacher, but you're just kind of sketching. And then at the end of the class, you're like, whoa, I got this really cool drawing in my sketchbook that I 
really kind of only halfway paid attention to. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let my self con or subconscious kind of like take over a little bit. You know? Yeah, and for not, sure. Not overthink things. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I think it's really cool to have, um, you know, a time frame and uh, given, you know, a miniature deadline just with uh, like with screen printing and you guys. Yeah, having absolutely. All these orders and you're like, oh, we got to get these done in these three weeks or two weeks or whatever. If you had two months to do it, you might you would take two months to do it. But yeah. uh, you're like, oh, we got to bust ass. We got to get this done in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. How do we make it? You know, how do, how we do you make it done? happen? Yeah. So uh, I think deadlines are very important because artists at heart, even though we love creating things, we're also lazy people. As yeah. Well. You know, we all procrastinate. <laughs> yep. We all like, oh, man, I love making artwork. But sometimes I just want to lay on the couch. Yeah. You know? 100 so percent. Having deadlines and. uh so I, I think of a concert as a little miniature deadline. It's a, a window of an opportunity, and uh, you know it's a uh, it's been very beneficial for me. I painted probably I tell people I think I painted about three thousand paintings in the last ten or fifteen years. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And That's... like you know I've got paintings in thousands of people's homes, yep. prints, stickers, and thousands t-shirts, of people's homes. yeah, t-shirts, 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 stuff everywhere, you man, know, all over the place, and. Uh, you know, it takes just grinding away yeah. at, you know, chiseling away at that, you know, block of your artistic career where you get to uh, that point where people recognize you and uh, just like going back to your uh, trade shows and yeah, things yeah. You're like, oh, we did them a couple of times. Next time, some people are going to remember us and yeah. recognize us and come look for us. That's kind of what happened to us when we went out to Furnace Fest this last year. It was our first year vending Furnace Fest. We had multiple people come up to us and they're like, "Oh, you guys are the grind time guys. I listen to you on on you know on podcasts or I watch you on YouTube or I've bought whatever you know." And it's just like, "What? Like really? Oh, really? You're a real person? Really? You, you, oh, cool. they, you are real and you live somewhere other than Jacksonville <laughs> yeah, with our yeah. friends, you know? Yeah, it's that, pretty amazing to think that whatever you do, art, podcast, printing, that you can be a little part of somebody's life. Like, yeah, yeah. Across the country, all, across the world. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, no, so, the internet has opened it up to such a it's made it so easy to get uh, your message or your art or anything just to a worldwide audience. And it's, it's a really cool thing. And I was, I was actually going to talk about a little bit. So you obviously, you went and painted your first show and then you did that for a little while, but at some point in time, you actually transitioned over to deciding that you were going to do this full time and it became, and you've been doing the full time art thing now for, years am i correct yeah, it's been uh going on 13 years i was gonna time. say and dude so. that right there let me give you a that's, round of yeah, applause yeah. for that I mean, right there my dude that's pretty Thank awesome you. yeah uh, you know we still uh supplement the income with other jobs we still have full-time jobs and this is this is great it's showing a lot of growth and we're whittling away at that block but it's not at a point where we could make it a full-time thing necessarily so Anytime you can see one of somebody you're, you're another artist or somebody that you're inspired by, you know, making art full time for a living, I, I think you've won the game, right? You, yeah. You've you've you figured out the cheat codes and you got there, man. I mean, like, dude, it's, and it's, that's it's, that's it's, it's, and not even cheat codes, but like you put in the work and you and you won the game because I feel like that's being an artist, being a musician, growing up. I remember yeah. being like, I don't need to be a rock star necessarily, but how could I make a living? just playing music like just doing that yeah and i ended up transitioning obviously more into the booking side of things and like venue management because that was where i was best suited but it was also somewhere where i could make an actual solid amount of money or uh, you know consistent money whereas being in a band and oh we're playing in alabama at blah 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 bar on thursday night and we're getting paid 75 dollars and we're gonna sleep on joe Alabama's couch Mm -hmm. and it's like oh uh, yeah 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 and I remember just kind of thinking like if I could ever get to that point where I could do my art full time and not have to do anything else that's all I'm really looking for you know and and uh, I commend you greatly man because that's that's a huge accomplishment it's pretty awesome for you to be able to say look I'm, I'm I make my living and I pay all of my bills from painting not that's awesome that that's 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 incredible so badass you know what i mean and it's it's not like you wake up and you're like oh, shit i gotta go to work it's like no dude like you're like cool I get well and i'm sure there are i'm sure work. there are those days yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's but, awesome yeah, i would like to talk about one thing real quick yeah along that is that uh you know there's a 
people always want to think that it's like a rock star or a super famous artist or nothing. Yeah. And there's so much in between like hobby and superstar. Yeah. You know, everybody, one thing people always tell me and I'm like, gosh, why you got to say that to me is that no one's going to like your artwork or your artwork's not going to be worth anything until you're dead. And uh, I'm like, well, that's not I true. mean, I make a living as artwork yeah. now. You're, you're killing it. Dude. There's lots killing of it. artists that make, you know, $75,000 a year or whatever. that are super successful and got every, all their bills paid. And that's you amazing. Know, they're living life and, uh, and doing everything and they're successful artists yeah. and uh people have this antiquated old school uh you know kind of a van gogh yeah it yeah, all yeah, comes yeah. from friggin van gogh that you struggle your whole life and then you die and then people discover you after you're dead yeah but that's like 1800s kind of mentality <laughs> where people didn't <laughs> yeah. get from one city to the other until like the printing press yeah yeah 100 percent work over or whatever and the world was a much smaller place yep. and then people oh that's one of the biggest quotes people always say to me that and like something about bob ross but yeah. uh, but i'm like man you know there's all kinds of working artists there's all kinds of artists musicians people that you love that aren't millionaires yep and uh they you know you don't have to be super famous and at that top tier level of success to be successful for sure 100 percent. you know you don't yeah. Well, dude, if you if you weren't good at what you did and and hadn't been doing it for so long, you wouldn't be getting some of the jobs that you get. Like, you don't have to be dead to be getting, you know, like you're saying, making money at it and doing these things. I mean, for example, look at the you know the Jason and Duane who own you know Spliffs and 1904 and Underbelly and everything. You've painted in every single one of those buildings. I mean, there's a reason for that. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? It's yeah, yeah, because yeah. you are so good at what you do. Yeah, and, yeah. and your art speaks for itself. You know. It, there's other artists in the city, but they're not Brian Bernard. Yeah. yeah. You know I mean, what I mean? You, know, you don't have to be the best artist, and I'm certainly not the best artist, but, you know, making it, man, just, like, doing the work. And, you know, like I said earlier, I've, I've made and sold probably 3,000 paintings. Yeah. And if you sold 20 paintings, you know, you didn't do the work. You're not like, why didn't I make it? Yeah. And you're like, get 3,000 paintings out there or 1,000 paintings or 500 paintings or yeah. whatever you do. Yep. You know, print – a million T-shirts. Yep. Whatever. And uh, if you do the work and stick to it, uh, and you know, usually it'll pay off. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's not, I, I tell people all the time, it's not the most successful or, like, best artists or musicians that make it because a lot of them get fed up and give up. Yep, 100%. So it's like having that stick to itiveness and uh, staying with it is half the battle. Yeah, 100%. Because there's definitely artists. Like, I got into the BFA program at FSU, so okay. that was a little bit more of a specialized program where you had to meet with teachers and kind of, like, work on building your style. And that okay. was the last two years I was at FSU, and I, I stayed in college two years longer just to stay in that program. Yeah. Just to work on my style, because regular art school is just kind of doing exercises and learning basic things. But in the BFA program, you're really kind of directed to create your own style and everything. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I would definitely say you have your own yeah, style. Yeah, man, that's, that's, sure. that's something you've accomplished. Uh, I, I, yeah, people always tell me that they can got recognize it. my painting. 100%. You know? Anywhere, dude. 100%. Anywhere. Anywhere. House, they're like, oh, I didn't even have to see the name on it. So. 100%. No, but, I, um, but in the BFA program, there were so many artists in there that were better than me that I was like, oh, I'll never be as good as those guys. And, like, uh, when we graduated, there'd be, like, a, every semester there'd be a graduation show, and you'd have an art show at the FSU Museum okay. and everything. And, uh, like, half the people that graduated with me, probably almost all of them, like, just immediately stopped making artwork or got a job in some other profession. Like, a lot of people, when it wor started working for anthropology, it was yeah. a newer company back then, and yep. they, like, worked as doing, um, you know, setups for their displays and stuff stores, in stores and stuff yeah and that was still art and everything but uh but it was just people kind of quitting what they did and just yeah. like doing something completely different and even though i worked in restaurants and made a shit ton of pizzas over the years i was still always working <laughs> on my artwork and yeah. considered myself an artist yeah for and sure kind of just like this is what i do to pay the bills but yeah. i'm really an artist yeah definitely and um you know i think that's a cool thing to have too in uh so many people just have jobs that don't really mean anything to uh, to them. Yeah. And they go to work and they hang out and do whatever in their free time. Yeah, they and, just go through uh, the motions, man. They don't have, like, something where they're, like, I, they don't have a calling. Yep. Where I'm, like, that's, 
I feel like that's a, such an important thing in life is to have something that you feel like you were meant here to, you were put here to do. You yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, most people sticking with it. Like most people I graduated college from quit artwork and they were just like, Oh, it's an art degree. It's <laughs> yeah. A college degree. I'm going to do something else to make money. Yep. And, uh, it's just kind of, I feel like I'm one of the only people that kept making artwork for the 20 years after college. Yeah. And, uh, and it's paid off in the yeah, long run. Yeah. yeah. Paid yeah. Off and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And really the last two years of COVID have been my best two years. I know. It, I, so you sold a I had ton made of stuff a, in the last, like I had made a small note to yeah. discuss that when the pandemic happened, you actually, it seems like, yeah, man, you went well, you through the that, roof. That sometime. group, that you group were doing page, the right? group page with yeah. the auctions and yeah. it seemed like, the people, you know, obviously there are a ton of people that I know and from Jacksonville area that have Brian Bernard artworks yeah. in their home, me included. And it's one of those things where I feel like not having seen you out and about because we couldn't go to concerts and it wasn't one of those things where people were running into you. But you were obviously still at home painting yeah. and you still obviously had things going on. And as soon as you found that avenue to be able to put those out for the people who were massive fans of your artwork already – just we hadn't seen anything recently you'd painted you know yeah. and then all of a sudden it was just like explosion man and yeah. it seemed like it did really well for you talk yeah, a bit, talk yeah. about that a bit yeah well uh in the beginning of 2000 around april um you know everything shut down yeah so i was just like man i make most of my money going out to concerts painting at concerts and selling stuff to people in person yep and uh I was like, what am I going to do? I started doing this like daily coloring book drawing. I remember I was that. Just giving that out for free just to kind of build some interest and stuff. And then I started a Facebook group that was the Brian Bernard Art Collectors Club. Mm -hmm. And I encouraged people to get on there and uh, share their pictures of your stuff in their of home. My yeah. Work in their homes, yep. you know, to kind of make a little community and bring my fans together. And real quick, I got, you know, like 1,500 people on there. But it was 1,500 real people. Yeah, and, you 100%. Know, uh, with social media and stuff, there's a lot of fake bots. Yes. And, yeah. You know, there's followers a lot of them. that don't really interact with you. Yes. But I got, like, 1,500 people that were just posting stuff on my page all the time. And real quick, there was, I think, 1,800 paintings got shared on my page. It's awesome, man. And um, then I started doing, since I was just stuck at home, and I've got, like, all kinds of old paintings or at the time I had a lot more old paintings. So I started just uh, doing auctions and kind of clearancing stuff out and, you know, making good deals on things to my customers. And I was just selling stuff all the time and everybody mm -hmm. was stuck at home all over the country at that time. So everybody was on Facebook. Yeah. Like just, I don't have anything to do today. Let's scroll through Facebook. <laughs> yep. And you know, you started seeing with musicians coming up with uh, different live, the live streams, streams and, and stuff like that. And, yeah. Uh, you know, virtual busking and all this mm -hmm. different stuff. And it was kind of, I was doing the same thing. Like uh, one day I did an auction that was just like on Fridays, I was doing an, a silent auction every Friday where I'd post, you know, 10. Uh, the second time I did 30 paintings. Wow. And uh, I had 30 paintings on a silent auction. And, you know, half of those paintings were selling for half price or discount yeah, yeah, or yeah. whatever. But some of them weren't. Yeah, but, yeah, like, yeah uh, for sure. One silent auction, I sold 30 paintings in one day. Yeah, it's amazing. And that was, awesome. like, the amazing. best thing I've ever done, like, <laughs> yeah. as far as money making for a day. Yeah. Even though that's, you know, months of work. For sure, for sure. into that. But, uh, but, yeah, I was doing that and kind of just – you know, changing things up because I didn't have the the physical audience in, in front of me anymore. Yeah, so, uh, that had to be such a good feeling. Yeah, when man, you did it, was, that. Uh, like, it was to have all of them sell in one day. Like, I mean, like, it's, it's mind blowing. Yeah. It's it's interesting to see, and we've we've talked to a, a lot of the guests on the podcast this season about the pivots that were made when the country shut down like yeah, that. Yeah, man, it was like sink or swim. You know, yeah, like yeah. for any industry, everybody was like. If I don't do something different, I, you know, I'm going to, I got to get a job somewhere. <laughs> yeah, 100%. You know? it, yeah, it, w it was something we faced, and that's, that. I mean, that's, I was telling you earlier, that's kind of where the podcast came out of, is it was one of those things where we had a massive amount of time on our hands that used to be spent screen printing, and then no one was ordering screen printed shirts at the moment because everyone was out of work, and no one really wanted to spend the money on t-shirts for staff, yeah. so that made sense, but 
and no bands were playing, so no bands wanted to print T-shirts unless they were selling them online, and there were there were some of that. But we quickly pivoted into, you know, we did the 1904 and the Dalton's shirts where we created a design and we printed them up front, and then we sold them and we donated the 100% of the proceeds, you know, profits to the actual companies to kind of try and give ourselves something online to be helping. And then we started the podcast so we could hopefully be bringing in new followers to the Grind Time page, even though we didn't have a ton of stuff to print and like show on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to see the pivots that everybody's made and how they've they've went from being pivots, but I'd imagine now you still probably sell a decent amount of art. Have you, have you noticed that you've sold a de- more art online now, even that things are going back to the way they were? Are you well, selling more I than was, you were uh, before the pandemic? You know, at that time, I put all of my effort into online stuff. Got it. And, Got it. And uh, now that things have kind of come back and, you know, being in Florida, things are pretty open. And yeah, everything. wide open and, at the um, moment. <laughs> <laughs> like, I kind of, I've gone back to selling way more in person. I got it. I got but, it. Uh, but that's kind of on me because, you know, if you're doing everything, marketing, online, yes. social media, and creating a body of artwork and going out to shows and all this, it's hard to keep up with everything, it, everything yeah it's and, uh, very difficult it's real easy to get behind on your your website or your social media and oh, stuff. we know so, that all too well so all too i've well. kind of gotten back to the i don't post as much but like then i was i was just online yeah, you know, yeah i was yeah. like online for 10 hours a day doing stuff yeah for sure and for um, sure but so i need to get back into making that push because you know ideally you got great online presence and a great in person -person yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah the the, you're you're good to go yeah the passive income from online stuff i mean if you can get it to a point where you've got stuff up there and you're making money while you're sleeping selling stuff online it's 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 really cool to the point where i was like just spending 10 hours a week packaging stuff up and going to the post office (laughs) yeah I I i bet I don't know how people do this if they like or <laughs> like people that sell stuff on eBay and stuff that are like, oh, I sold a hundred different things that have to be shipped out every single week. You're like, that's a lot of stuff to package. Up yeah, and, for sure. And do that stuff. So, well, I wanted to also talk about uh, since we're talking about the live paintings and things being back kind of opened up. This was just a weird question I had. And, and, and you don't feel free to tell me you don't want to answer it. But so you get a lot of artists that you have signed the paintings. Okay, that was one thing that I always thought was really cool about, in particular, I remember the first time, and I don't don't know what show it was that it was at, but I remember seeing, having seen you paint at that night at the show, and then at the end of the night, you were tracking down some of the band members to have them sign the back of the painting that you had painted throughout that show, and I remember kind of thinking to myself, like, what a cool added value that gives me as a as a, a consumer, you know, like to. It's one thing to have the painting from the night that it, you were there and it was painted and you were at the show and you had a great time. But then that extra little touch of having it signed by the artist is is pretty awesome. And I, I, I guess most of the time it seems like, you know, there's a lot of artists that you've worked with before, you've painted at their shows before, and a lot of them seem to have no issues. Have you ever had an issue where you had just some asshole that didn't want to sign the back of the painting? Can I ask that? Um, you know, really, I've only ever had problems with like two people my entire career. Really? Wow, that's really good numbers. That's, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> like, I, and it wasn't about, I've never had anybody like about autographs. It's just uh, a couple, uh, two tour managers. Oh, that didn't want to let you yeah, to the actual tour artist. for bigger bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh. That was the only time I ever had wow. any real trouble. That's awesome. And uh, But usually artists, I mean, you know, even if it's a bigger artist, yeah. I'm not dealing with superstars. Yeah, yeah you know, you're I'm not dealing like with Britney Spears the and Elton John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever. <laughs> but uh, usually people are, musicians are super nice yeah. people, usually, yeah. you know. Yeah. They're uh, people, people, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Usually they're happy to sign it unless, uh, you know, they're getting swamped by people asking for yeah, other yeah, stuff yeah. or something. But I kind of – I used to be a little more nervous about it, but now I'm just kind of like, 
put my painting in front of the little girl <laughs> that's talking to him like hey can you uh sign yeah. this real fast <laughs> kind of thing yep but uh <laughs> no it's it, it like i said it's it's i had to ask because you know even just at furnace fest this last year we gave out a bunch of uh, stickers and stuff like that. And we were, and you know, it had been a long time. I feel like when I was a kid, we gave out flyers at shows. Like All that was the, the thing. Time. You would print like thousands of flyers. And I remember going out and standing outside of Jackrabbits on so many Thursday and Friday nights, handing out flyers for my show at Jackrabbits two weeks later yeah. when everybody left the bar at the end of the night. And I remember being a kid and getting a lot of rejection. Obviously, there's people who just don't want to take the flyer from you. There's people who don't. They don't have the time to sit down and hear what you're trying to talk about. And uh, it was always interesting to me because I hadn't thought about it until we went to Furnace Fest. Mm -hmm. And it was, you had like three groups of people. You had the person who immediately took the sticker. You had the person who was like weary about it for a second, but then was like, oh, it's a free sticker for real. Okay, all right, yeah, I'll take the sticker. Yeah. And then you had the third group of people that were like, I no. have blockers on. I have no, no talking to you i'm not having anything to do with you and whereas most of the musical artists i've met over the years have been really cool people and super receptive and and i also think that it helps that you're a creative and i like to think that creatives is a big thing for us creatives inspire or embrace other creatives and i like i would like to think that you wouldn't get a musician that would see oh here's this guy who painted this awesome painting while we were playing tonight let me be an asshole to him. Yeah. So, you know, I would, and, but at times I definitely, it's obviously a little different than handing somebody a sticker, but at the same time, I always wondered just because I would be nervous walking up to some of those artists and asking them to sign something. And I think that's maybe just my personality. Yeah. I could have a conversation with them when they're loading in for the show for two hours, but I'm weird about asking them to sign something sometimes, you know? Yeah. You know, one, uh, one signature I had to chase down and I was, I kind of had to just jump in there before they like jumped in a limo and sped off. Basically, <laughs> was uh, Frank Black from the Pixies played? Oh, okay. The old Underbelly. Yep. About it's probably been about ten years ago. Yeah. But I really wanted his autograph. I had a painting I did that night in this big silk screen poster that somebody had done for that show, and like the person I was with at the time was like, "No, don't bother him." And I'm like. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, like I just a, like once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm like jumping in front of the door so it can't like close. Like, yeah. we sign these real quick, and uh, <laughs> and he signed them. You know, it's like sometimes you gotta, you know, just take a yeah, just put it out, jump there, in man. there when the moment presents itself. But, yeah. Uh, but you know, that was awesome. One of the biggest signatures I had. You know, like the Pixies. Who doesn't know who they are? Yeah. No. No. For sure, but, man. That's uh, awesome. But yeah, you know, it's uh definitely one of those things where it adds a little extra bonus of coolness or value to the 100%. painting. There's been a lot of times where people wanted to buy paintings and they didn't even care what the painting was. They just were like, they knew it was signed yep. by the artist they liked. Yep. And uh, at a show they were at, like yep. people from New Orleans have hit me up about the paintings that I did with George Porter Jr. or Big Sam's Funky Nation or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or stuff like that. Or one time the Resolvers played at Freebird and, uh, you know, I had a bunch of people that the singer from the Resolver signed my painting and look how big they are now yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Up for the Rolling Stones and stuff. Yep. And, uh, huge. I'm like, oh, I probably won't ever get that guy's signature ever again, you know, <laughs> yeah. at this point or right now anyways. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, one of those things where it just, uh, is a little extra cool thing to capture the moment. Yeah. And man. live painting in general is like that. It's like a time capsule. Yep. Even if I don't paint, anything that's really relevant to that show i'm just painting whatever i want as far as subject matter yep but if somebody watches me paint a painting start to finish at a show that's one of their favorite musicians and like all their friends were there and they had a great time yep it was their birthday it's seizing the moment whatever yeah. you know it's like this time capsule that represents just an awesome good time for somebody and that's just like when you're selling stuff, you want things to be cool, yeah. you know, and that just like adds that cool element. To no, it, it really does. Man. You're like, yeah, I mean, you can't go anywhere else and get this painting that was done this night and signed yep. by all these people. It's yeah. A one of a kind, unique object. Yeah, no, man, I, I think it's a really cool aspect. And like I said, I, I had to talk about it and ask about it because it's something that I, I meet a lot of live painters, uh, obviously in, in the years playing in sport and going to a lot of festivals, but I will say that you're the only person I really feel like I see do that on a regular basis. I'm yeah. sure there's others. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. there are. Well, I got that from uh, 
Scramble Campbell. He okay. Like, he paints at everything at, at Red Rocks. Okay, but got he, it. He was from Florida. Okay, my buddies in Fernandina have like lots of his artwork, and they were like good friends with him. That's pretty cool. Fernandina, he would paint at Dog Star. Okay, and like, man, uh, Dog Star, man. My buddy Patrick oh. has a Volkswagen bus that's covered with his artwork. One oh, of his pretty sick. With a big Jerry on the front of it and everything. It's awesome. And people would tell me like, he was live painting since the eighties. Yeah. Oh, so wow. like, wow. He would travel around with his uh, girlfriend at the time, Sherry, his wife now, but yeah. uh, and just paint for fun. And she started selling stuff like when he wasn't looking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thing. <laughs> but uh, back then, he, he would get things signed by people like. Uh, one of my buddies always tell me how, you know, he'd have all these paintings that he did with widespread panic before yeah, owls were died. So wow. he's got all these paintings sound, signed by him that are, you know, nobody can ever get. Yeah, again. for sure. And uh, and, uh, you know, he's got like a garage full of paintings, just thousands of paintings <laughs> nuts, that man. he has that are documented. Yeah. And they're all signed. That's and it, crazy. Just, like. You know, my buddy is like, oh, this painting's $5,000 because it's signed by people that aren't around anymore. Yeah, for sure. You know, maybe he kept it for 20 years and then some doctor or lawyer that was in medical school yep. in college or, you know, whoever, or yeah. whoever successful person yeah. 20 years later yeah. that has $5,000 yep. extra to spend is like, I want that painting now. 100%. So that kind of gave me the idea that, you know, yeah, I should get things signed and that it adds some extra value. It does, and man. Documents it a little bit, and um, it does you know. for me. I mean, like I said, it de- it definitely does for me. I uh, autograph things have always been a cool thing for me. I you know I got like an autographed Tom Brady hat that my uh, my grandpa <laughs> got me in Indiana. Yeah, you know, a, a random or no is 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 it Tom Brady? No, it's Peyton Manning. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's better. That's it's Peyton better. Manning. I'm in uh, football. Uh, but, yeah, Peyton Manning signed, like, hat. And it's just, like, he worked for a Cadillac dealership, and he just happened to be wearing a hat and was seated next to him at, like, a NASCAR race, him and his brother. And it actually is Peyton and Eli Manning on the hat. And it's one of those things where they both signed it. And, you know, to me, it didn't mean anything. But I've had some buddies over the years who've been, like, major Peyton Manning, Eli Manning fans that are, like, Yo, you got a hat signed by Peyton and Eli Manning? And I'm like, yeah, it's been the same hat. Man, yeah, that, but that'd sell for a lot. And I'm like, really? Like, that doesn't mean much of anything to me, but I think it's the context of it. When it comes to, like, an artist, artists are almost my uh, my athletes, you know, like yeah. musicians. And, uh, like, that was that's always been what I've connected heavier to. So, but autograph things and stuff like that, like even signed Pokemon cards. I think that's oh, one of the coolest things. Yeah, man. You get yeah. a Pokemon card signed by the original artist. For that's, some reason, that just that holds it, such a high value. It, and it may, and it may, to some people, be like, "Oh, it's an ugly Sharpie signature on the front of the case or on the front of the card." Yeah. But to me, it's kind of like, "Man, that's the guy who did that. Like, that's yeah, pretty yeah. awesome, right?" Like, yeah. or or it was somebody like like the band from the night. Like, it really does. It provides that time capsule that I think really just kind of takes people back to that moment every single time they look at it. And uh, it does add an incredible amount of value that I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, moving right on into, uh, I guess, the rest of 2022. I know we're right here at the beginning of 2022, but what you got planned for this year, man? Obviously, Florida is wide open again, so back into the live painting thing. Um, you got any festivals that you're planning on trying to go to this year or any any other stuff you're trying to work on? Well, really, in the last few years, I kind of got away from painting at music festivals as much because it's just – it's a lot of it's a lot of work. Yep. It takes a lot of energy, yep. just like a band going out there, mm-hmm. and it's great promotion. But you know, it doesn't always pay. Just like with bands, Definitely. you're getting out there, you're getting your stuff in front of a lot of people. And I would still always sell things, and I'd have successful, you know, festivals and everything. But kind of as my business has grown, and you figure out what works, yep, and you figure out what doesn't work, and you kind of try to whittle away. Things, so you just have the most successful formula. So uh, in the last few years, I've really just kind of stayed in the Jacksonville and Fernandina Beach area and worked on more projects around here. I've, in the last few years, I've done a lot more mural work. Yep. And uh, so I've. But you're pretty, in the process of right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm working on a new mural in downtown for you know our buddies at a new venture. Yep. And 
and uh, hopefully that'll be open soon. And I don't know mm-hmm. if they. <laughs> know about yeah, yeah, I think I think so, it's still yeah, a little really under wraps. It I think yet, it's still you know, a little. But it's a little coming more soon. flavor for downtown Jacksonville. Yep, yep. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, I've got you know some other murals lined up for some clients. Um, I've, in the last two years with murals, I've done more murals than I. I've done in the. I mean, you did the one to Underbelly. What was it? A, a year ago? Two years ago? Or what? The big, what the big copper tail one. I can't remember if it was the end of 2019, going into the beginning of 2000, or if it was just. The I was it was like right say, after they got it, it and yeah, started yeah. renovating it right before everything shut, shut down. down yeah, and that so, one's huge. Yeah, yeah, I did that one for Copper Tail Brewing mm-hmm. for one of their beer logos. So. It wasn't my artwork. It was cre- recreating another artwork. Right, but artwork. it was still a, a mural but, you yeah, got to paint. Like a, and, well, and, and you know, story tall, yes, like, it's uh, and, and what I like about it, man, is even if it is like a rendition of like one of their artworks or their created you can logos, still see your style you, it's a in Brian. It, yeah, you can still very much feel like when you see that, and then you were to go over to like the old Spliffs location, and you'd see the other art that you had painted in there or oh, anywhere yeah. else or over at 1904, you very quickly can start to tie together like, I feel like the same guy did that robot and that turtle or whatever yeah, in Jacksonville yeah. that did this copper tail thing over there because yeah. you do have a defined style that I think is obviously one of the biggest parts of being an artist in general is setting yourself apart from everyone else yeah. and having something that's kind of your thing. And uh, I think that that's one thing that definitely – uh, we notice and i feel like a lot of other people notice is just like uh, even just all the way down to man i'll tell you what i used to go to lomax lodge all the time when i was young right yeah when i was living in riverside and it would took Sean me Thurston's years paintings. it took me years don't you have a you have a painting somewhere over there near lomax lodge do you not um yeah on this on the back side there, on the side of the building where larry's giant subs is there's and two dude, big owls for there. years i never realized and then one day I'm walking by it and I go, that's definitely Brian, right? <laughs> like, that's Brian right there. Yeah. And then I see your your name and I'm like, okay, well, there we go. Like I, It's one of those things where even artwork that I had seen for years before I knew you as an artist, as soon as I got to know you as an artist, it started now popping out more and more it. and more. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's Brian. That's Brian. That's Walking into my friend's houses. Oh, yeah, oh that's cool when Brian did. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. And in, in a... I think it, it works really well for you, man, and it's one of my favorite things. I love your art style. Obviously, we got to do some really cool T-shirts for you a while back, yep. and that was awesome. But uh, I, we love it, man, and we really appreciate you coming in and hanging out and talking with us a little bit about it. And uh, anything else you kind of want to discuss before we move on into music and food news? Anything you want to talk about on the podcast? Um, no, I mean... Uh... Why don't you tell at least everybody where can they find all your art stuff? I know we oh, got yeah, got if, uh, websites, Facebook, Instagram. You know Brian Bernard Art on Instagram, Facebook, uh, my Facebook group, Brian Bernard, the Brian Bernard Art Collectors Club. Get in there. You can just yep. friend me on my my personal <laughs> Facebook, Brian Bernard. Check me out, and uh, I've got links on in my social media. To I've got a a thread list and a Red Bubble store and a Big Cartel store. Yeah, but. Uh, you can hit me up. You know, I do commissions. I do murals. I do a little bit of design work. Um, yeah. Custom paintings. Yeah, you did you some know. spore designs for me that we've actually mm-hmm. been reprinting here in the last, like, year. Yeah. Yeah, we reprinted that octopus. I think we're about to redo yeah. the giraffe. Yeah, yeah. So, Heck yeah, man. yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, cool, man. Like I said, we appreciate you coming in and hanging out, and we're going to go ahead and move on into a cool little segment. If you want to hang out for a little bit with us, we'd yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, we got thanks some for mu- having me. Yeah, we got some music and some food news over here, all right? and uh, These are fun. First... <laughs> We're going to go ahead and start with some music news, all right? Mm. We're going to go ahead and kick it off with some music news. And I'm going to start with this right here. Let me get transitioned over for all the viewers at home on YouTube. All right, so Michael Lang, organizer and producer of Woodstock, dies at 77. All That's right? It's crazy. It's crazy to me just because... Woodstock, right? I like I mean, so many documentaries about Woodstock, and he's in every single one, dude. I mean, he's a, he is the founder and creator of Woodstock. Yeah, well, he's definitely he was definitely a big part in it, and obviously, yeah. you've been living under a rock if you've never heard of Woodstock Music Festival. And I, I felt like this was a good one to bring up because obviously, Brian, you and me have done a, a lot of experience in the music festival thing. Yeah, um, we've been to a lot of them, and and obviously. 
this was the model for all of them. <laughs> yeah, of, this know. was the the precursor for everything that uh, Blackwater and Bear Creeks and Wani and all that kind of popped off of. And it's a uh, it's crazy. In fact, you know, they did two Woodstocks. So they did like the original one, and then they did another one in the '90s. And I think both of them, the the one in the '90s went really bad <laughs> from from everything I've I've read. This one was just absolute insanity. Obviously, the property got trashed. There was way too many people that showed up. It was but two, I, it was like two different ones, man. I was like in '69, it was like peace, love, and happiness, and then you come out to the one in '99 or whatever it was. Yeah, and well, it's there like, was one in I think there was one in '94. Yeah, there was, but it was a there small was one, one in like '99 or 2000. Yeah, yeah. So as funny as this is, and I'm not sure which one it, it was exactly that I went to, but I grew up, you know, hearing about Woodstock and going to music festivals. And then it must have been 2015, 2016, I decided to go up to a music festival that only happened one time in New York called the Hudson Project. OK, uh -huh. it was put on by the same people who put on like Camp Bisco and a bunch of other music festivals. And I'm like, the lineup was great. Sound Tribe, Bonobo Live Band, like a ton of great bands. So I'm like, I'm going to this thing get all the way up there and as i'm arriving at the property somebody i overhear that works for it tells me yeah this property hasn't had a festival since the woodstock in the 90s right and i'm kind of like the woodstock in the 90s now which one or you know is it the big one the little one whatever come to find out it's the one where all the mud happened and i only know that oh. because the last day of the festival Saturday, sunday morning we wake up pouring I've down seen, rain i've seen moby I've seen Sound Tribe. I've seen Bonobo. I've seen everybody I really want to see for the weekend, except you know, there's like Bass Nectar Sunday night. But I wake up Sunday morning, and it looks like it's going to torrentially downpour. Okay? I'm in my, <laughs> I'm in my tent. I know that I'm like a almost 20-hour drive from home. I got to get back. So I look at my girlfriend at the time, and I'm like, hey, are you cool with just forsaking Sunday and just leaving? Like, let's just pack our stuff up, get to our car, and get out of here before the rain starts. Yeah, I'm into it. So we pack up. We leave. By the time we hit New York City, I start getting all the Facebook notifications that everyone's been evacuated from the festival property, <laughs> and there's like a huge storm warning. Everybody's being sent to their cars, and then a few hours later, I get the notification that everyone Blue Cross is being dispensed to people's cars to like give emergency food and water because they don't think they're going to be able to get out of their cars for like 20 plus hours. What? Right? And like it, all this nonsense. At the same time, I hear that Bonobo Live Band's playing in Central Park for free, so I wheel off into New York City. I get to see Bonobo Live Band a second time. <laughs> I get to see Bonobo Live Band a second time for the weekend. And then I get home, and the, the, the whole thing's still going on. Like two days later, there's still kids stuck in their cars. There's, there's cars that are stuck on the property and all the mud. And I guess the festival organizers had signed a deal with the local tow truck company that if any vehicles were towed off of the property for the festival, it would all be done through the local tow guy who has one tractor and one tow truck oh my and there's God. 500 vip cars stuck in like mud on the fair on the grounds it was an absolute nightmare but i ended up getting home and uh they refunded me for my sunday tickets because it was such a crap shoot so oh, well, there you go, i man. avoided all of it and then got some money back in the end but hey. i it was at the woodstock property and i'm like oh my gosh woodstock right all the mud all the nightmare but obviously this was a this was a huge thing. This is still something that like uh, you know my kids gonna read about in like history books. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah, for sure. Woodstock was uh, to this day. If you meet someone who's like some old timer who's like, yeah, I was at Woodstock. Yeah. You're like, whoa. Yo, you yeah. got some yeah. stories. Let me hear. Yeah. I want to sit down and talk you with have, you. You follow uh, Richard Borders on Facebook? No, he's an old cat that's in Jacksonville. Okay, he's in his seventies, but he did like visuals and lights at every somehow he was at every major concert ever <laughs> like look him up on facebook yeah, I definitely richard will. borders <laughs> he's coming out with a book and he's going to do a show at the planetarium a light show oh, oh sweet sick. Dude, sweet name any band like he posts every day at this day in 1968 the guy has got like a photographic memory yeah he just posted he's like in 1968 i was at on tour with yes at this show <laughs> no way at madison square garden or maybe it was seven yeah, yeah yeah but uh he's just you know whether it's the beatles like the like the craziest the beatles things playing in jacksonville yeah he was there like, that's nuts man <laughs> he's nuts like with <laughs> anybody any led zeppelin show like all these huge shows and festivals this guy was like at all i think he was at woodstock too. yeah it's awesome it surprise me with that kind of but know. uh yeah i just uh, am amazed every day he posts something cool with like a 
poster and he's like, yeah, I've got photographic memory and it's still developing. <laughs> but <laughs> That's yeah. a good way to put it. But that makes me. Yeah, I've, I've only met. I've, there's one guy in town that I've met. He's actually an incredible jazz drummer. He used to play at the uh, the Casbah on Sunday nights. He did a jazz thing. He's a drummer that played at Woodstock. And wow. he's from Jacksonville. People call him the captain because he wears a captain hat. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh, dude. He's unreal. He's unreal. But if you have a conversation with him and you ask him about Woodstock, he will get all into it with you. He'll, He'll tell you all about Woodstock. On on, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Right. So, what uh, else we got? We also got this Super Bowl halftime show, right? Did you watch it? Yeah, I, I just watched the halftime right, show. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Dude, but, the yeah, halftime show it, was awesome. Yeah, so the Super Bowl halftime show obviously – hit super hard on that like nostalgia factor for yeah, the, especially dude. for the millennial generation i mean if you were a 90s kid yeah. or grew up at all in the 90s and listened to snoop dogg or dr dre i mean and if you grew up in the 90s how did you not listen to snoop dogg dr dre eminem i mean it was kind of whether you were into it or not it was everywhere i remember going home Remember when Eminem came out, the, the remember real when he came Slim out Shady too. and all that? Yeah. And man, it was just like TRL was broken. You know what oh, I'm saying? Yeah. He, had, he had rocked yeah. that thing for number one so long they had to retire his video. Yeah. You was, know? Uh, his music video was just on constantly. Yeah. So, but obviously, the, the halftime show, big things. I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about it real quick because it was one of my favorite parts. I'm loving all of the pictures of Snoop Dogg smoking. Before he went on, and the video, and the How picture of him he? walking picture out with a blunt. Back. Oh yeah, he's got a yeah. blunt on stage, and I'm like mm -hmm. Snoop Dogg. And I'm like, but at the same time, but that's, that's that's who that's, he is, that's though, dude. Snoop Dogg, right? Like, like, and he would do that in any state, anywhere, whether it yeah. was legal anywhere. in California or not. But <laughs> he doesn't care. I think he just has a honorary, like yeah, he's like Willie, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Willie he's Nelson. A, you just get an honorary yeah. pass. <laughs> like we can't mess with him. He's Snoop Dogg, right? Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, it was great. Eminem, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre. Yeah, Mary, uh, J. Mary Blige, J. Blige, Kendrick Lamar, 50 and Cent. Fifty Cent surprise uh, entrance, dude. It was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. man, how awesome is this? Yeah, it's it's funny because I was just actually talking. I was watching an article not long ago with Jay Z where he was talking about when Fifty Cent came out, and he was talking to everybody about how y'all get ready. He's telling all the other rappers uh, up in the studios. He's like, Fifty coming. He coming and he about to hit it and then in oh, the club yeah. hit. Oh yeah, and all the rest I of them. I drove through Atlanta on the way to this camping trip one time in like 2002 or three when that song came out. Yeah, and it was just you would change the station and it would just be on. Everything it was like one, yeah. every station in Atlanta was just changed from station to station. <laughs> all playing Fifty Cent. Yeah, no, oh, he. Mind. I mean, it was huge. I, and so and really cool that he kind of came back, you know, and was able to do that. So. You know, I was at uh, Books a Million the other day, and I almost bought, after that performance, I was looking in the, like, business section of, like, you know, motivational books. And 50 Cent has, like, a Oh, dude, he's a, he's a, a very big entrepreneur or something like that, wow. where he's got, like, a business book of, like, top ten <laughs> steps to make it in business. I also heard an interview where he was talking about some rapper that – he recorded a diss track for him and the rapper like didn't ever respond to it and he came up to him one day he was like dude what did i ever do to you kind of and he's like nah man i, I threw you an alley-oop you were supposed to slam dunk it yeah yeah, yeah. Like, you were supposed to record a diss track for me and then we were gonna blow up yeah yeah, and yeah. everybody was gonna like listen to you just like yep you know machine gun kelly and Eminem. yeah 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 you're that like, was a what big is, one. What real? What is really happening? Did yeah. they have conversations? No, dude, they didn't have you, no beef. I can guarantee you, you it was yeah, it was all business. Business, dude. You That's wonder the at whole times, point. and and it's so funny because it's funny you bring that up specifically. Is Tupac dead? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you bring that up because a big. So I follow a lot of YouTubers from like the UK, and there's a big YouTube group called Trap Lord the, Ross. No, I, well, no, I haven't. There's a big YouTube group called the Sidemen from like the UK, London area, and part of a huge portion of their views five, six years ago. Part of the big reason a lot of them blew up and they got a lot of their friends' big careers on YouTube was because they all started writing diss tracks on each other, and it was one of those things where the diss tracks were pretty like. They were pretty brutal. Like, they were going for the throat a little bit. But at the same time, they all, you come to find they out five, six years doing. down the road, they all knew what the hell was going on. And they were, no, none of them were concerned what the other was saying about them. It was all clickbait. It was yeah. all, uh, 
It was all a marketing scheme, but yeah. we're gonna you go create back this to internal those, drama. You and go are back, eat it up. You go back to those videos, man, and they've got like twenty million views on them. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting here like, oh my gosh, what a you're what like, a great that, way that to penny of you or whatever <laughs> some people get on their monetization. Yeah, what is it now? Some people, I know some people get a penny per view. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm whatever, sure, so. I'm sure. Dude, listen, some of those people, when you think about, like, Mr. Beast and, you know, the guys and, and the sidemen like and all them. Guy. Yeah, Mr. Beast is, is definitely up there. But then it's funny because when you try to pin down, pinpoint down, like, how much they make, as much as they gross in, like, YouTube revenue, I feel like most of their money comes from sponsorships. Like, YouTube's ad revenue system actually pays much better than – you know, Sp Spotify or anything like that. Like YouTube yeah. gives you a pretty good, a decent chunk of ad revenue, but at the same time, and I'm sure the bigger people have better deals, but at the same time, the amount of marketing and advertising, like Mr. Beast will put out a video and that video does millions of views. Great. But that video also had him signing like 50,000 t-shirts he sold. And when you start to think about the number of t-shirts at 30 bucks a pop, I mean, yeah, he had to autograph every single one of them, but at yeah. the same time, the guy blew the blew it out the water on the t-shirts compared to the video. You get a stamp at that point or what, man? <laughs> Signing 30,000 t-shirts. Oh, man. Recently, yeah. uh, one of my favorite YouTubers is Artist 1000. Okay. This really cool graffiti mural um, YouTube page. Okay. And he, he did a <clears throat> GoFundMe or what's the other one? Uh, oh, uh, oh Kickstarter. man. Kickstarter. Kickstarter, yep. But he did a Kickstarter for this deck of cards where it was all art, you know, Really cool. He did a series of videos, like ten videos, going up and up to it, and he beat the record for best deck of cards because that's a thing that people make cool yeah, decks yeah, of yeah. cards and yeah. put them on Instagram or I mean uh, Kickstarter. But he made two million dollars on his kick wow. Kickstarter. But that involves all he like made the artwork and all kinds of T-shirts, pins, yeah, stickers, yeah, yeah. all this stuff, and like he's got a team of people to help him, but. It's like 18,000 packages that have to go out. Oof. And, you know, it's like if you got five people putting out 18,000 packages, it's still going to take you three, four, five months yeah. to get them out. Yeah, 100%. You're like, that's crazy. Yeah, it's insane to, to think about that level volume. of success where you're like, how long does it physically take to <laughs> sign 30,000 items? I know that it's a pain in the ass for me to have to take three shirts to the post office sometimes. Well, I, we, so. we've, yeah. talked, we've, we've talked about, like, what if one day we got, like, a 100,000 shirt order for some giant festival or something like that? It's like, are we going to turn that down? No. We just got to know that for the, hire 10 for, the, people for the next six yeah. months or yeah. however, like, we are literally going to be in here uh, seven days a week, sun up to sun down, and – we're just gonna absolutely make it happen and do whatever we have to do to, to yeah. get it done and, and yeah it's it, it is that. it's incredibly time consuming though without a team I can't even imagine like when you get when you get to that level of success that it, there's just I don't know how you find enough hours in the day it begins to get I mean I struggle to find a lot enough of hours a lot I, of I I struggle to find the hours yeah. in the day and I don't do that much compared to these people. <laughs> So, but yeah, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. Eminem obviously took his knee. Um, that was a big thing. A Snoop Dogg with his blunt. That was a big thing. So the halftime show just 50 really cent has upside down. Fifty cent like upside down <laughs> might be the biggest thing of the Super Bowl yeah. halftime show. Um, but I can't yeah, believe he gained thirty pounds. Yeah, yeah. people are so freaking out about. It. It's like, yo, wouldn't you after twenty Listen, years too? I, like, I, I mean, did yeah. see Come on. my favorite meme from the entire Super Bowl was a picture of Fifty Cent from the video and in the club, and he's all cut without his shirt on. Uh, yeah. and then the, and then it's a picture of him from the halftime show, and it said Fifty Cents now a dollar oh, fifty, no. <laughs> yeah. a buck fifty or yeah. something. Dude, I died. Um, well, so yeah, that was pretty cool. We got Snoop Dogg has uh, bought out Legendary Death Row Records. Um, I'm so happy for him with this. I think it's awesome. So like Suge Knight was everybody's enemy, right? Yeah, uh, Death uh, Row, and now he bought him out. Yeah, he bought his. Do you I think mean, he really held Vanilla Ice over a balcony by his. Uh, um, by with his, Suge Knight uh, ankles. That's yeah, like the big thing is that he. Yes, I bet you he did, dude. Right. Suge Knight was brutal, bro. Yeah, he that, was ruthless. Yeah, I I think it's interesting because in the '90s, obviously, like the the east coast west coast rivalry yeah, like he was all in the, the car with tupac when he got shot yeah right? yeah so i mean like there's some there was some wild gang stuff that went on in the 90s inside like the hip-hop and rap community and it's it's cool to see that i mean obviously it's moved forward in the right direction i think in general there's still obviously even in jacksonville we have like issues with 
rappers and killing each other and writing songs yeah. about it. So I yeah. mean, like it 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 gets there, but it's uh I think Snoop Dogg. I've got to think if anybody can take Death Row well, Records in the right direction at this point, it's going to be Snoop Dogg. Well, what I think I is, mean, is great is that him and Suge he had a falling out from Death Row Records years ago. You know what I mean? And to see that now he's gone back and it's kind of like a big F you to Suge Knight. Like, ah, guess what, dude? I'm by your whole label. So yeah. how about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know he had like that No Limits record. No, that's uh, no, no Limit was, uh, that was Master P. Yeah, I know, but Snoop Dogg back then he left and he put out an album on No Limits. Oh, did he? It was an orange one. That, how oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He had like one album with like, the typical like uh, how all the covers look. They yeah, were super yeah, yeah. bling and like all crazy. Like, <laughs> he knew it was them. Yeah, you know? yeah. But he had one album that was out on there. It wasn't really that great. But. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's one of those things where I don't know. You know, Snoop Dogg's had some incredible hits over the years, and not to take away from Snoop Dogg, but like you know, there's only so many Snoop Dogg songs that I'm into before it starts to be like well, I don't know any of the. I, you know, I'm not. You're not gonna catch me listening to any Snoop Dogg B sides. You know, because I don't know them. But back but, in the day on those early Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre records, oh, talking, dude. you know, diss tracks and stuff where it's like, I forget the song where it's like F Easy E. Yeah. F oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Death Row Records, F blah, blah, blah. You yeah, know? there were, dude, no, that was that was a big thing in the 90s, and it's 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 interesting. Oh, well, we got some rain coming yeah, in. I can hear it. All right. We got well, that's going to go ahead and no, that's going to wrap up music news, and that's going to bring us on over into everyone's favorite section oh, of the podcast. Get ready. A food news. A food news. Live and improvised every single time. Yeah, Copyright like me, YouTube. Yeah, that's Copyright our, me. It's our food news thing. Um, so, yeah, right here. There we here, go. Let's right see what you rip. got for me this time. Right off the rip, Alan. I, I'm, I'm bringing it out for you. Taco oh. Bell is adding a flaming hot Cool Ranch Doritos Locos Taco to the menu. Bet. All right. I'm there. I'm not sold. So what? Uh, listen, dude, we've already been over this. Uh, uh, Taco Bell one is amazing. Is low on the priority totem pole mm. for me. Okay. It's not it's for like, me. It's like it's like if my wife wants Taco Bell, I'll eat Taco Bell. That's but, not true, bro. You it, have gone to Taco Bell plenty of times. Yeah, you like Taco no, Bell. No, I go to Taco Bell because their Mountain Dew is similar to the Bojangles in the <laughs> sense that they've like figured out the syrup crack level to be like, this will addict you. So the Taco Bell Mountain Dew is incredible, but... You know, and what I about don't the girl. Baja Blast? Are okay, you, I'm not a Baja, Baja Blast not guy. Like Baja I don't Blast? either. What? I'm not a Baja I don't, Blast they guy. recently just made a energy drink or something yeah. that's available in stores that's yep. Baja Blast yeah. outside, and I'm like, dude, no. Baja Blast. I will literally go to the gas station if they got Baja Blast in the in the can. I'm like, yes, give me that. No, it's amazing. No, <laughs> no, I ain't into it. Uh, listen, I am a uh, I am a Mountain Dew aficionado like it is I I, I I I would be surprised if I die without Mountain Dew tattooed on my body somewhere oh my god but at the same time man I can't get into like all the random the random Baja blast Locos, and like cool ranch no like. but what, no I'm talking about Mountain Dew right now what I'm talking about is Baja blast or like all this crazy Mountain Dew patriotic crap that's in your fridge every time I go to your house <laughs> And you're drinking like there's a new you're drinking new, like try red, white, and blue, and it's like blueberry, cherry, white yeah, berry, yeah, Mountain Dew. Never made a flavor where I'm like it's better than the original. 100. Uh, percent The OG is the best. The OG is no, the best. The original is no, the best. No, the the, the the voltage is probably the voltage. The closest voltage one. is good. The orange or live wire. Why live wire? I don't like you the like voltage. the you like the orange one. You like the live wire. I like orange. the live wire. And if I was gonna pick a number two in the Mountain Dew catalog, I'm going with Code Red, Bo. I'm going with the number two. I'm going with the second one. That was ever made. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Code red, I'm into it. If it's cold. As soon as code red gets like anywhere near room temperature, it is one of the worst drinks I've ever drank in my life. But code red, cold, great. Mountain Dew original, cold, warm, hot, iced, chilled. I don't care. Give it to me. I want to drink it. <laughs> I'm into it. Give me that 54 milligrams of caffeine every 12 fluid so ounces. What, so, what, so what's going on here with Taco Bell? So, so just bringing, Taco Bell's bringing out, you know, they did the Doritos Locos Tacos thing. Oh, wait. it's They did used to have a Cool Ranch Doritos So they Locos, had a Cool Ranch. But this one's flaming hot. This one's cool flaming ranch. hot Cool Ranch version. Oh, I'm going to try this tonight. All right. And that just sounds <laughs> I like. Am. I'm going to get this tonight. And that just sounds like awful things for me and my stomach and everything else. I got a stomach made okay. of steel. Listen, when they ask me if I want mild, hot, fire, fire. Blah, you know, I go, 
please don't put any of that poison in my bag. Oh That's my basically God. what I say. Because I'm going to be honest with you, man. If I eat that hot sauce from Taco Bell on a taco, miserable. Tomorrow tomorrow going to be a bad day. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I, taco Bell, if you get three items, you don't need 32 sauces. <laughs> Like, what is going on? Well, here's the thing. The other part. I, I, mean, I like that because I stick one, them. There's places where they'll give you a napkin <laughs> per item where you're like, oh, this messy stuff. But they're like, you got one soft taco. You need a half a pack of sauce. Yeah, 32 packs. <laughs> Dude, I love that because I take like, them and stick them in the fridge and I got them yeah, the next time. Yeah, but you do that one time and you got a year's supply. <laughs> it's it's say, like, man, I've you? thrown away. I just... I'm like, I would like one or two packs, but it's to the point where I'm just like, no, thank you. I don't need <laughs> yeah. any because I feel so wasteful. I, I actually went out. Taco Bell, Yum, I believe, is the corporation that owns Taco Bell and Lay's and, and Pepsi uh, and all that. And yeah. KFC and, and uh, Pete Tut and all that. Yeah. You could save some money, people. Just <laughs> make a rule. Cut back on the sauce. One sauce packet per item. You don't need <laughs> well, any more I, than I, that. I, well, I, I don't know about that. Listen, because bro. I probably use two to three packets right, per that's item disgusting. I use. One additional sauce just to have a bonus <laughs> sauce. Not per item. But, per bag. But. So like, it's ridiculous. I went out and bought a bottle of Taco Bell fire sea sauce. Turtles. So why the hell do you need the packets of it? You have a bottle in your fridge. Because I've ran out and sometimes I haven't got, went back out. How and much got was it that anymore? bottle of Taco Bell sauce? And, like, get a bag of the packets and just like <laughs> empty them back into it. <laughs> He's in there mixing the fire <laughs> and the hot. You're like, oh, oh that's a yeah. really oh, good idea, where, actually. Uh, Someone really like Aunt Jemima on the bottle, so they got an old bottle and they just keep refilling it with new <laughs> syrup. And they're like, oh I love God. Aunt Jemima, so I'm keeping the bottle. <laughs> and they've refilled it like ten times in the last two years. Oh, it's hilarious. God. Dude, whatever. I just <laughs> I think it's funny. You know, I do like I, I, that idea of I've never mixed hot and fire together, but I bet that's really delicious. Now, well, I mean, you can try it tonight. I'm definitely right? gonna try you that. The suicide of all the fla- Ooh. sauces. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Put it in the bottle. Yeah. And you got your own. You might as well just put the sauce in a cup and and just not even eat the taco. (laughs) Throw the taco out and just drink the sauce. Half sauce, (laughs) one little squirt of Baja (laughs) Mountain Dew Blast. Shake it up. It's probably explosive. You can make a Molotov cocktail. So so you probably don't know. Like I, I am a connoisseur of not only hot sauces. Like I have an entire fridge drawer or shelf of like 25 hot sauces. But my, I'm, I'm a giant condiment fan as well. Like, I have to have – everything has to has a sauce, dude. Like, I yeah. can't not. So, it's like where Chris can't stand condiments, I'm the complete I, I, opposite. No, and listen. Like, I like condiments. I just don't like the, my food swimming in condiments. He can't stand McDonald's McChickens because of the amount of mayonnaise, and I'm like, yo, give it to me because I'll no. eat it up. I don't, I don't like, know I what it. is wrong I with McDonald's. Hey, I got I, two breakfast sandwiches, biscuits this morning. And I had to add mayo to them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on a breakfast sandwich, I could get, I could understand. L- listen, Especially I'm a mayo. Biscuit, I can know? do yeah. mayo guy. I can do I can do condiments. My issue is that Alan's one of those per- people who's like wants to bite into a sandwich and have it like ooze out, shooting out the sides <laughs> and all yeah. over his hands. Yeah, and I'm dude, like, I want it. I want it like, messy, dude. No, no, that just seems bad. Um, but yeah, Taco Bell, you can go try this out, Alan. Uh, mix yourself a little hot and fire sauce together. Yeah, They're also try. adding two more items: the Cantina Crispy Chicken Taco, uh, which mm-hmm. has chicken marinated and jalapeno Ooh, buttermilk sauce. Wait, I might try that. Coated in tortilla chips, um, and then uh, the Cantina Crispy Chicken Tortata. Okay, so Let's go get, get back some. on the potato front. <laughs> oh, All right, those yeah. fries, like you take a cheap item. Potatoes are cheap. Yep. You turn them into those fries that are delicious, and you make lots of money. Yeah. Why do you got to take them off the damn menu every other? They're like, oh, we put them well, on there like for the Mexican one day gone? a month randomly. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand. The nacho fries were a home run, in my oh, opinion. For sure. Like, why, that, that if you're is... not making money on something that people love, raise the price. Yeah, 100%. I'll continue. I'll pay $2 or whatever it <laughs> yeah. is. I want those freaking nacho yeah, fries. Yeah, 100%. Back. No, those, those things are ridiculous. They're one of the best things that they ever did. Why? Right, what's the other thing you got here? And this guy... All right, M and M's is ready for Easter candy with its new honey graham what? milk. All right, now see, bro, this is where oh you lose me, dude. God. What the hell are you talking about? Dude, Have you ever not... had an M and M? Yeah, really I'm not. They're, they're, they're delicious, are, okay, bro. Yeah, peanut butter ones are. No, li- all right, listen. What what is it about peanut butters that sounds better to you than M and M's honey graham? 
with a crisp rice center that's covered by milk chocolate and complete with brown and various shades of yellow shells. All right, the brown and yellow shells don't mean anything. Okay, that's just food coloring. But what I'm saying is honey grams. I am a graham cracker person. Mm-hmm. Okay, you remember being a kid and going to school, or or at least we got them in like daycare. You'd get the graham crackers that were covered in chocolate, the chocolate graham crackers, no. little squares. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Dude, they're the fire. All right. Every time I go into a Dollar Tree, I walk out with like three packages of them oh, to this day. Okay. So the fact that in my kid, she is an M and M's nut all right so if i'm at the house and i want some chocolate nine times out of ten what can i rely on there being but see m and i'm also that okay you know i'm not like oh i want some chocolate i don't like chocolate yeah but that's why you're wrong i'm not wrong <laughs> i'm not wrong <laughs> so this is uh this is obviously a little bit of a new thing for like easter I would not baskets eat this. i'm not i'm not gonna eat this this i it just i'm also not i don't like s'mores well see okay all right all right I'm not the biggest s'mores fan because I don't like hot marshmallow. I don't. Yeah, I'm not. I don't, I'm not really a marshmallow. It's impossible to make like a perfect. S'more. No, you're always yeah, no, gonna burn you the marshmallow. It, it's gonna break solid, the pieces. The marshmallow is like... burnt. <laughs> the graham crackers are broken. I, I'm not into it. So like, even eating this is just like it just oh. it gives me that same feeling. So I'm just not into that. I think the thing with uh, s'mores is it's the location and the it's like my paintings being at a cool experience. You're like camping with your dad and your Boy Scouts or something, <laughs> having fun. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. So you're like, s'mores are cool, but <laughs> logistically in the real world, they're there's not. better things on s'mores. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to bring up one more article about how avocados may face a shortage because I know you're way into avocados, but. Good. <laughs> Let them stay on a shortage. That's going to go ahead and wrap things. That's going to go ahead and wrap things up for today. Brian, man, we appreciate hey. you coming out and hanging yeah, out man. with us today. Thanks for having me. We had a great time. Make sure y'all go and check out Brian Bernard online. You can find him everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, the Big Cartel Shop, Redbubble. Uh, make sure you follow Brian Bernard and uh, make sure you tune back in in 2 weeks. Well, our next podcast guest is going to be Mr. Jason Honeycutt from 1904 Music Hall, Spliff's Gastro yep. Pub, Underbelly Jacks. Uh, very excited to have him out here to talk about the music venues in downtown Jacksonville and what we see got going on in 2022. Yeah. All right. But for now, from the grind time shop to wherever you are, we hope y'all have a wonderful day and we'll see y'all soon. Peace. We out.